you can vote by absentee ballot for the uh, the town elections. Right. The polls are open from 7 in the morning until 8 at night, but if you are going to be out of town, if you can't make it for any reason, there's still time to get an absentee ballot. Right. Absentee ballots can be picked up at the uh, town hall. Uh, what you need to do is, is go into the... Um, uh, into the uh, town hall, um, ask the town uh, clerk who, uh, who is there where you register your car uh, for an absentee ballot. And what they'll do is um, uh, give you a, uh, an absentee ballot. You can fill it out there or take it home with you and mail it back to you. But it's important that it gets back the day before the election. Uh, and any absentee ballot, obviously, would have to be picked up and filled out and returned um, the day before the election, which would be the 11th, which is Monday. So if you're going to get an absentee ballot, you have to go down and pick it up either tomorrow, Friday, or Monday, the 11th, um, to, to be eligible to vote. And uh, this, being a very important, uh, um, this being a very important election season, uh, I think that, uh, that anybody who's eligible to vote should vote, and, uh, and we hope that you vote conservatively as well. Um, and uh, again, uh, um, what we wanted to also discuss at this time is, is what you'll be faced with when you see the ballot. Um, right here we have a, uh, a specimen ballot, and I know you're not going to be able to see this ballot uh, because of the glare we have on the lights, and, and it's, uh, it's impossible for me to show it to you. But what I'll do is I'll run through what offices you can expect to see, and, and, uh, and Sandy, you can also uh, hop in here. Okay, um, there's a lot on it. Why don't we start off with what the first item will be for District 3 residents, what they'll see on the ballot. And that is uh, District 3 Town Councilor. Now, you have two choices for Town Councilor. And, uh, Sandy, you can uh, go ahead and explain this. Okay. These two. <laughs> the District 3 area ha actually has the opportunity to vote for two Town Councilors this year. One is their District Councilor, and your choices are between Mike Smith and Fred Tompkins. Mike Smith is the candidate that the Dairy Taxpayers Association has endorsed. I think Mike will do a real good job for the Town of Dairy. Fred has been in office for a number of years as a selectman, as a town councilor. He's been through several forms of government. and Essentially, he's been, uh, if, if I'm correct, I think he's been involved in town politics in one, one fashion or no another through uh, planning board and zoning board and the like. That's uh, for right. about 25 years, I think, is what he 25 says to 30 some years. of his articles that and I've read. You know, if you look at Derry now, if you think it's time for a change, if you're not happy with what you see, I strongly endorse Mike Smith. Yeah, I Mike think has a lot of energy. He was willing to put the work into it. Mike will stand up for the people of Derry. Yeah, I think uh, I think Mike's a good choice for that district. Uh, myself, I'm from that district, and uh, uh, actually, me and Mike uh, ran against one another a few years right. ago, and uh, and we both lost to Fred at that time. Uh, of course, if we had known each other a little bit closer back then, we may have not uh, both run together, and one of us would be in the uh, position now. But, right, uh, because <laughs> the total votes that both of them got far outnumbered Fred's, but unfortunately they split the vote not knowing each yeah. other. Well, that's sometimes the case of what happens. Um, uh, the next item, or the item that, uh, that everybody else in town will see um, as their first item in the ballot, if you're from District 1, 2, or 4, the first item you'll see on the ballot will be uh, for Councilor at Large. And uh, there's three people on the ballot for Councilor at Large. Um, Okay, I'll run down the names, and Jim, I think I'll ask you to do the endorsement on this one. All right. Okay, we have Craig Bulkley, who's the current councillor at large. He is the incumbent. He's been serving as councillor at large for six years. And now, he was town administrator for a time, too, before For a short time, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Back um, sometime in the mid-'80s, I believe. I don't know exactly when. But he was the town administrator. So he's, again, another person who's been involved in town politics or um, in a leadership position in the town for a number of years as well. Right. The other candidates are Paul Hofgarten and John McGondal. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't think it's any coincidence, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Hofgarten's not a very popular name in town. No, I believe there are two of them in Derry. That's right. And, uh, and you would be the other uh, one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought he was the other one. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyhow, that must be your, uh, your brother? <laughs> Your husband, yeah, obviously. That's why, of course. I and, think uh, most of us know that. And uh, Paul's throwing stuff at his TV right now. Um, Paul is uh, is running for a town councilor at large. Uh, John McGondal, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't really have a lot of information on him. I've read a couple of the bios on him, and I, to be honest with you, I haven't <laughs> gathered. Uh, I haven't uh, really uh, formed an opinion on uh, uh, on where he stands on a lot of issues. But I do know that Paul is uh, is a very conservative person, uh, very fiscally conservative. 
um, and, and, and I think that's what we're looking for. He's, he's, uh, he's a very involved person in town. Uh, he sat uh, as uh, vice chairman of the zoning board. He sat on the zoning board for a number of years. He's still on the zoning board. Right. Uh, in fact, that's where he is tonight if, he's, uh, if it wasn't canceled. <laughs> no, it's not canceled. Um, he's there. Okay. Also, um, Paul is also uh, sat on the uh, school budget committee um, back a few years ago or the school fiscal advisory committee. Right. And the budget committee. Right. And, uh, and also, um, Paul is, uh, is also uh, served as vice chairman of the charter commission. Uh, which was formed last year, and uh, so Paul is uh, is pretty much involved quite a bit in town uh, town town um, uh, affairs, and and uh, has been an active member of the Taxpayers Association for a number of years, and uh, is certainly uh, um, somebody that uh, the Taxpayers Association had no problem endorsing because of his uh, conservative stance on a lot of fiscal issues. Um, the next uh, three or four <coughs> issues uh, or or items that you're going to see on the ballot are essentially un uncontested races for um, some of the administrative positions in town and the, uh, and the boards in town that we do elect. Um, the first one is supervisor of the checklist, which uh, uh, we have one person running um, unopposed, uh, so that there really isn't, uh, isn't much of an issue there. Right. The rest of those races that are on the ballot, the supervisor of the checklist, the library trustees of both the Derry Public Library and the Taylor Library, and the trustee of the trust funds, it's not that those aren't important positions, but they're all non-contested. Right, and and essentially uh, we didn't uh, we didn't feel it was, uh, um, you know, it, it's it's not a big issue. Uh, you vote for two, and there's only two people on the ballot, so you know, use your best judgment, I guess. Um, also, uh, what we're going to have on the ballot this year is uh, three budget questions, and they're kind of split up a bit. So so why don't we go through the first budget question that's on the ballot first, Sandy? Okay. All right. Who wants to take well, it? Well, I'll take it, I guess. Uh, the first budget question. Um, uh, reads as follows: uh, Shall the town of Derry approve the new charter recommended by the Charter Commission? And uh, essentially, what the uh, the Charter Commission has come back with is a uh, is a substantial uh, change in the form of government. And uh, uh, myself and Sandy both sat on the Charter Commission and and have differing uh, opinions uh, on on uh, um, which charter is better. <laughs> I, I personally feel that that the uh, personally feel that the uh, charter um, proposal is uh, is uh, worthy. Um, Sandy and and the um, Taxpayers Association both have taken a position on it, however, that uh, they were not going to support the, uh, uh, the town charter. So they're urging uh, residents to vote no on the first question. That's a no on the first question, the first ballot question that you come across. Shall the town of Derry adopt a city form of government? And that's the long and the short of it is a city form of government. And it takes away some of the... Uh, um, Exactly. That is why the taxpayers. That get involved in. yeah, that's why the taxpayers association decided not to endorse this proposed charter. It does have some very attractive clauses in it, and it wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't a unanimous decision, but it was. We were pretty comfortable representing the organization, and saying no because, you know, I've I've spoken to the taxpayers association at a couple of meetings about the charter. I've taken kind of an informal poll of the membership. There is some support, but it doesn't seem to be there on a real large scale. Most of the people that I've talked to are not comfortable with the city form of government. Basically, what the city form of government will do, it will take away our right to vote on any kind of budget issue. If you remember, this charter commission was formed due to a citizen petition calling for a budgetary town meeting. We weren't allowed to just change the current charter and put in that type of government. It was a different form. So the compromise was we'll elect a new charter commission and see what they come up with. No. City form of government no. doesn't allow us to vote on any budgets. It does not allow us to incorporate the new ballot law that's out, the Senate Bill 2 or RSA 40 colon 13, which we'll get into in a lot of detail later on in the show. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other thing with, the, um, with, uh, with an item like this is it, is it kind of shows the diversity of, of opinions that we have in the Taxpayers Association. and and how it is a, uh, a large tent um, that, that we do have. Uh, we have libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, you name it in our group. And, uh, and we all uh, bring to the table our own opinions and views of different, uh, different um, avenues of how we feel the town should, uh, should approach issues. And, and what we try to do is build consensus in the Taxpayers Association. We don't uh, rule with an iron fist and say, uh, say this, is, uh, this is what the top two people in the group think and this is how we're going to go. It's, it's essentially uh, built through consensus and, and how the group feels. And, 
and uh, and uh, that's that's how we work things, and, and it's and it's very successful, I, I think, and it has been for the last it year. It is. We've got a wide variety of people, not only down the political lines. We've got people from college students to senior citizens. We've got professionals. We've got blue-collar workers. We've got full-time mothers. We've got just about any kind of person you can think of in the DTA. This is you can. You, there's no such thing as a typical DTA member. Right. Um, okay. The next question, and one of the reasons uh, why the Taxpayers Association did not endorse the uh, or, or uh, uh, support the uh, charter change, is uh, they felt that it would be uh, wiser to put a budget cap in place on the town side. So the next question you're going to come to, which is uh, Article 2 under ballot questions, will be listed as, shall the municipality approve the charter amendment uh, reprinted below and essentially it goes into the details of how the budget cap will work and uh, Sandy uh, why don't you take over okay I'm pretty familiar with the tax cap in fact Paul did write it so I've seen an awful lot of it I've seen the stages of the research this is very similar to a tax cap that is currently in place in the city of Franklin it has seemed to work very well people in Franklin are happy with it the way it's written is that the council, when determining their budget, cannot set the tax rate, and granted they don't know the tax rate when they're setting their budget, but they have an idea based on last year's figures. They cannot approve a budget that would set the tax rate higher than the current t rate plus the CPI, which is basically saying you can't raise our taxes more than the cost of living. I think it's a pretty reasonable request. I think so too, Sandy, and, and uh, if I'm correct, uh, Nashua also has a budget cap in place and uh, there was an effort um, at hand uh, I believe in uh, in November during their municipal elections to repeal the budget cap that Nashua has in place and a lot of people had said to the Taxpayers Association see Nashua is even trying to get rid of their budget cap well uh, lo and behold Sandy I believe if I'm not uh, incorrect here that uh, Nashua's budget cap uh, uh, to to do away with the budget cap was soundly defeated, soundly. nearly two to one. Exactly. Um, I mean, they might have tried, but apparently the people are happy with the it. People are are happy, and and, and the people who voted for it, I have a feeling, are a lot more than the members of the Nashua Taxpayers that's, Association. That's right. They're a very large and active group, but to get that many votes, it's not just the Taxpayers Association. This is private citizens of all beliefs. They want the taxes under control. So that's that's the uh, that's the second question, the second ballot question that you'll see on the on the uh, on the uh, on the ba on the ballot, and uh, we're urging that you vote yes for the budget cap um, to put a little fiscal restraint and uh, give us a, some sort of semblance of where our taxes are going to be, at least on the town side. Um, and and having said that, we'll get into the uh, Dairy Cooperative School District uh, issues that are on the ballot. Now we have four, I'm sorry, five candidates listed on the uh, ballot running for school board and you're allowed to vote for two of those candidates very important you remember out of those five people you need to make two check marks on there and uh, what we're <coughs> urging is that you check off the uh, the top line which is for Mark Donovan and uh, and the bottom line which is for Bob Thompson or Robert Thompson um, also remember when you when you do fill out the ballot there are two sections in there for write-in ballots so don't check off the write-in section make sure that you're checking next to the person's the right person's name um, uh, it can become very confusing and uh, and I know Grinnell School is not a very well lit uh, gymnasium and that's one of the complaints that quite a few people have had mm -hmm. um, when they're filling out the ballots that they have a difficult time reading the ballot so um, if you have any difficulty there's moderators there that can give you uh, give you some assistance so don't uh, be intimidated uh, to go in and ask for assistance. Um, so again, uh, <coughs> there are five people on that on that ballot, um, and I'll run through them right now. It's uh, Mark Donovan, which is uh, the vice chairman of the Taxpayers Association, the normal host of this show. He's uh, he's running for school board. He's uh, a very well educated person. Uh, he's lived in Derry for uh, I believe just about oh, his entire life, yeah, and I know his Mark his, graduated uh, from Pinkerton Academy. His, he's been uh, to the Derry school. <coughs> yeah, his family uh, is also from Derry. And uh, in fact, he has quite a bit, quite a quite a bit of family here in Derry, and mm -hmm. he also uh, uh, has children in the school district as well. So, so not only is Mark going to be concerned about uh, 
uh, the cost issue as a, as a taxpayer association member and, and basically as a conservative, fiscal conservative, but he'll also be concerned about the quality of education. And, and I think that's important that you get those two aspects together in a school board candidate, somebody who's truly concerned about fiscal uh, uh, controls and also about the quality of education. Uh, the next person uh, down is uh, Chris Hyde. Uh, he's, uh, I believe he's a member of the Friends of Education. Um, mm -hmm. I believe he's a board member. If yeah. he's not, I, I know he, he was, was last year, I believe, yeah. and uh, uh, he's endorsed by most of the establishment uh, people who, uh, you know, kind of support the status quo. The next person down is John McGondal. Again, he's on the ballot. He's also the one that's running for uh, town council at large. Uh, again, I don't know enough about him to uh, to make a comment, yeah, so I, I don't care to do that. John has not made any of the candidates' nights, so it's really hard to say where he's coming from. Right. He may, may be uh, very fiscally conservative, but unfortunately we don't you know, know too much about him. He, um, again, the next person is Joel Albright. Uh, Joel... Uh, is the uh, former chairman of the school board or current he's chairman? The current chairman, yeah. And uh, he's—I uh, uh, don't know if he's a friend, a friend of, the, uh, member of the Friends of Education. I, I can only assume that he may be. Well, his thinking seems to be right in line. So whether or not he yeah. has a membership card is <laughs> really none of my concern. Yeah. If, if Joel wants to be a member, that's his business. Yeah. Um, again, uh, we feel he—he uh, he basically uh, uh, supports or endorses the uh, the status quo. Um, for that, so. And Joel has served. Is this Joel? Um, is Joel currently in his second term? He's, I know he's that he's um, in one and a, he's in his half term right. or one and a half. I know terms. he was appointed by the school board back in was it ninety two? Yeah, I believe when when, uh, when cousins, cousins stepped um, down. Right. Rather than look to any of the other candidates who had run, there was one candidate who had run and come very close, but rather than approach that gentleman, the school board decided instead to appoint this Mr. Albright, right. and he's been serving on the school board since then. Right. Okay. And the, and the last person on the ballot, um, again, put a check mark next to his name is Robert Thompson. And, uh, and Bob is, uh, is, again, a member of our group, uh, has been for a few years. Again, a very fiscally conservative person, uh, small business owner, has uh, a couple of children in the school district, volunteers yep. in the school district, or volunteered. I, I'm not uh, sure if he still does or not. Um, I know he's I know pretty he busy. I know he did last year. His work might business. have taken him away from it for the right. time being. Bob was a playground volunteer. He's very active in his children's lives. And he's, uh, he's again, he's another person that's, uh, that's lived in Derry for uh, uh, more than a decade, I believe about 16 years he's lived in Derry. Mm -hmm. He has um, family here. And his family is, uh, again, uh, another group of people that have uh, lifelong Derry residents. Uh, so it's... Uh, Again, uh, those are some uh, some key people to have. We feel as your counselors, it's it's always good to, uh, as your as your school board members. I think it's always good to have somebody who's uh, who's had uh, longevity in the town. Mark Donovan certainly has. He's graduated from Pinkerton Academy and gone on to higher education. And Bob Thompson again has had a lot of longevity and ties to the community. Exactly. I'd he like to make another point ahead. about Bob because he does have that longevity. He's made a commitment to this town. Last year he ran for school board and came very, very close. And he had come under fire at the time because his home was on the market. He said he was buying another house in Derry and in fact he did. His family is being driven out of Derry. His father-in-law is a retiree who can no longer afford the Derry taxes and is selling his home. His sister-in-law and brother-in-law are not far behind for the same reason. But Bob has chosen to stick it out in Derry. To, he's got, you know, his children are happy in the schools. He wants to establish some roots for his family. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that sh some of his in-laws were driven out by the taxes, Bob has made the commitment to this town. Also, um, you know, it's important too, Sandy, when we're going through uh, <laughs> candidates, that you look at a candidate who does have strong ties to the community because you don't necessarily want a candidate who, uh, who blows into town uh, to educate their kids, and uh, and uh, the day that they graduate, the for sale sign goes on the house, and they're out of this town. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that that people that run for office, uh, um, especially for school board, have um, you know have, have a couple of kids in the district, like they both do, and uh, and also uh, have ties to the community, like they do. But uh, getting on mm -hmm. to the ballot, I think the okay. next uh, the next item on the ballot, and it's the final item on the ballot and probably the most important item on the ballot, besides the candidates, obviously, is the, uh, is ballot question, the last ballot question, which is, and it's, and it's worded slightly strange. A lot, of, a lot of people have heard a lot about it. It's the official ballot referendum form of meeting. And uh, Sandy, why don't you... Uh, <laughs> okay, this is uh, one of my favorite topics. The way it's worded, 
says, shall we adopt the provision of RSA 40 colon 13 to allow official ballot voting on all issues before the Dairy Cooperative School District? This is what we've all been referring to as SB2. This is the ballot bill. Well, right now it's law, and we have the opportunity in Derry to vote for it. There's been a lot of controversy about it. In a nutshell, what this law does, it allows anyone who wants to vote on the school issues to do so. Right now, you have to be at the meeting if you want to cast your ballot. If this question passes, this law does go into effect, and starting with next year, if you want to vote on any of the school issues and you can't make it to the meeting, you still have the chance to vote. So let's run through it, Sandy. What, what, are, what, what are the benefits to uh, Joe Average um, for this, this Senate bill? Because I've heard a lot of um, conflicting reports, uh, mainly from uh, the Teachers Association and uh, people um, who uh, may be affected by allowing um, uh, more voter participation in the system. Um, and I've heard a lot of negative things by people who are afraid to allow people who can't get to the meeting on Saturday to vote. What, what, what will this do for the voters of Derry? Well, it allows, again, anyone who wants to vote can vote. They can vote by absentee ballot if they cannot be there. What happens is the district meeting remains in place, just as it is right now. We do everything as we have been doing all these years, except we do not cast that final ballot. We decide which budget will be presented to the voters. All of the warrant articles, monetary and non-monetary, will also be on the official ballot. Everything gets discussed and amended, if necessary, at the meeting. <laughs> we then have time to go home and think about it, do a little more of our research. We don't have to make a knee-jerk decision. We don't have to worry about someone watching over our shoulders. Yes, I know we've had the so-called private ballots at all of these school district meetings, but when you're shoulder to shoulder to some, when right. someone right. and you're trying to mark your ballot, it's not really a private right. ballot. And, and actually, you have to be at that meeting at the specific time that the issue is addressed to vote, as the current system is now. And, and under this SB2, or as they refer to it on the ballot as the official ballot referendum form of meeting, you'll no longer have to uh, sit through. You can, if you like, go to the meeting and, uh, and participate. We're, we're certainly not trying to discourage that by any means. However, um, um, what you can do is, is, uh, is attend uh, the meeting, um, uh, voice your opinion on where you feel on the budget, and then uh, several days later, or a month later, I believe it is, Mm -hmm. There's a public hearing in between, okay. so in case anyone is confused, because the meetings certainly get confusing. Right, so that then you'll get, uh, the ballots will be printed up in advance. You can, uh, again, just as I did with this ballot, go down to Town Hall and get a specimen ballot of what will appear on the uh, on the warrant so that you are understand where you st where, where, what issues you feel strongly about and how you're going to vote. Uh, and it gives you a good opportunity to, uh, to um, really get involved and understand the issues uh, and also increases voter participation. And, you know, frankly, Sandy, I'm a bit surprised um, that um, people such as the NEA, um, the teachers' union, would be against something that would increase voter participation because if the budgets and their increases um, in their wages were justifiable um, to the electorate at large and all the people in town who would want to vote, why would they be afraid that uh, that those people might come out and vote? Uh, would, they, would they think maybe that they'd vote the vote the budget down or vote their increases down? I have no idea. I can't get into their heads. Because I, Sandy, I, I, what I don't we know. have what we have is from the uh, from the NEA uh, New Hampshire Educator, which is the newspaper that the NEA puts out. And unfortunately, uh, again, you won't be able to see this, but I can assure you that it was in the uh, December issue of the NEA News. Um, they have a headline in there, <coughs> The Dangers in Senate Bill 2. And, uh, and it goes through uh, some things that, uh, that they feel uh, are dangers in, uh, in allowing people to vote on, uh, on all the issues by ballot referendum. Um, but most importantly, I think, is this paragraph in here that, uh, that says, says it all about where the NEA is. It says, if your local association, the, the NEA association, is faced with a warrant article proposing this change, instituting Senate Bill 2, um, you need to begin organizing now to defeat it. If a petition is circulating in your community advocating this change, let your Uniserve director know now. So essentially, the teachers' union is, is strongly opposed to this, which uh, it doesn't, doesn't really make sense. And one of the, one of the <coughs> reasons why they're opposed to it, Sandy, is it says, imagine a ballot with 40 warrant articles. 
how will voters recognize which ones they support? Well, I, I think reading they'd them be would able probably help. I, I, yeah. would have, I would assume so. And, and uh, I guess the same could be said is, is imagine a school district meeting with 40 Warren articles. How would the people be able to figure out what was going on in there? And the school district meetings have a lot more distractions than you're going to see in the ballot box. Yeah. And, and another thing in here, S Sandy, it says uh, uh, through one of, their reasons, one of their reasons um, uh, to preserve the, uh, uh, the school district meeting is they, they say here, don't throw away the one place where you have real, real power. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Well, that, that pretty uh, much says it all. Now I understand why the NEA is against it. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it's very interesting um, that uh, that they would be against it. And and I think it's important at this time too, Sandy, to go into maybe some of the uh, misconceptions that right. uh, that are on. Um, Before we do that, sure. I just want to give you a little. And I, I'm no, I know you probably remember sure. this. A little bit of a historic perspective on Senate Bill Two. Senate Bill 2, contrary to a lot of popular opinion running through dairy, was not a knee-jerk reaction to the Dairy Taxpayers Association losing the meeting last year. No. Back in 1993, there was a bill in the House, House Bill 497, that did essentially the same thing. The Dairy Taxpayers Association and several taxpayers groups had been giving their support to that bill for an awful long time. Unfortunately, the bill ended up getting tabled somewhere in the process. <laughs> because the NEA fought it so hard. Yeah, the, um, uh, you're right, Sandy, and, and, uh, and actually a few of the letters um, to the editor, and, and I don't really think it's fair to, to name the people who wrote the letters, but one of the people uh, um, uh, that, that wrote a letter in here uh, um, talks about uh, the fact that, uh, that we only did this after we, uh, we couldn't uh, get our budgets passed at the meeting, and certainly that isn't, uh, that isn't how we feel at all. Um, we've had many years where we haven't had budgets passed. Uh, in fact, I believe uh, there was only one budget in the last maybe 20 years that the Taxpayer Association supported that actually got passed. And if you remember when that budget did pass, the Friends of Education had lobbied Senator Russman to change an existing law to allow the school district to hold another meeting. Mm -hmm. Now you hear a lot of complaints about Senate Bill 2 or RSA 4013. The that official ballot will, referendum. Exactly, however you want to refer to it. That this will draw out the procedure. That we'll be going to meetings upon meetings upon meetings. But yeah. and that, sure and enough, with the one time they didn't get the budget they wanted, they wanted yeah. to have another meeting. Yeah. Another misconception of the, uh, of the ballot bill is the fact that uh, um, uh, some people think that there's going to be more than one budget on that ballot. Uh, and uh, uh, that certainly isn't true. Um, the purpose of the first meeting is to uh, to hash out what that budget's going to be that's going to appear on that, if I'm correct. Right. That's exactly what happens at our district meetings right now. There are often more than one budget to choose from. There were two on the warrant for this year's district meeting. They're not both going to pass. That's up to the moderator. What will happen under a, an official ballot rule type of town is when you go to the meeting, you decide at the meeting which budget will appear on the ballot. That's up to the moderator. All others will have to be amended to zero. Right, and uh, and those ballots, uh, that ballot will then go um, before the the electorate um, through secret ballot, um, where you can get absentee ballots, very similar to our town elections. So you can get the ballot, um, absentee or otherwise, at the election, fill it out how you like. If the budget does not pass, then it reverts back to the previous year's budget, which is then indexed.